Welcome to the Open Regulatory Starter Course, which in my opinion is probably the best way you could invest the next few minutes if you're developing a medical device or software as a medical device, because I'll show you how all of the compliance stuff works, how you can get it done really fast and how you can essentially save a gigantic ton of money uh, by not hiring consultants like us to explain all of this stuff to you and instead you just get the answers here which i think is pretty cool um, let's actually dive into it and i'll just go through all the questions which companies typically ask us um, in sales calls but also as consulting clients so you can actually see, um, let's dive right into it. I, I'll just literally share my outline with you. Uh, how much does typically uh, bringing a medical device to market cost? It's 50K euros for a notified body, 50 to 7K euros for consultants like us. We do it as fixed price um, offers and other consultants cost two to three times more, um, which is kind of important to keep in mind, <laughs> just like FYI. With us, it takes two to four months. With others, it takes around 12 months, um, around one year. Plus you have the 12 months for a notified body if you need one. Um, let's actually backtrack a bit um, now that I kind of like gave you a lot of information let me talk a bit more about abstract things. Um, the first question you have to ask yourself is like is it a medical device at all and if you go to our website you can actually use the search uh, feature and I'm going to use it here to search for something called definition. Oh yeah it has a lot of bugs. And um, here you see the definition of medical device. I'll skip ahead like a lot here and um, just skip to the relevant part for software because that concerns most people, uh, at least on our website. Um, so blah, blah, blah. If your software is doing diagnosis, prevention, monitoring, prediction, prognosis, treatment or alleviation of disease, your medical device. So maybe some quick examples. Um, if you're doing like like my past company Vara, pretty cool product actually. They were doing like uh, essentially breast cancer screening based on X-rays, so that sounds a lot like diagnosis of uh, disease, right? You take X-rays and you try to like detect uh, breast cancer on those. Um, or one of our other clients, one of our past clients, uh, Selfop, also a pretty cool company. Um, they have like an app. I think it's like smartphone based, but also browser based. Uh, for people with uh, psychiatric disease, like for example, depression. Um, and it's like an online course, among other things, um, for treatment of depression. And as I already said, uh, that sounds a lot like treatment of disease. So that's also a medical device. Um, so what's not a medical device that actually becomes, um, sometimes it's actually a bit tricky, but one example would be maybe the Headspace app. Or I actually just recently, I bought this Apple Watch and it has this mindfulness app on it. So that kind of like, it just gives you like, instructions for your general well-being for i don't know for like meditation or like for breathing exercises and as long as you're not really like treating disease with that you're not a medical device so that's like the one minute summary which is i guess like skipping over many details now the question is do you need an auditor or not and that's kind of like very important because there are different medical device classes so if you're class one and again this is in the eu if you're class one you don't need an auditor if you're class 2A or higher, so 2A, 2B, or 3, then you need an auditor. And again, there are some edge cases in there. There are like some special class 1 devices, class 1M with a measuring function, which kind of need an auditor. So it gets a bit weird. But to simplify it, the big question is, are you a class 1 device or not? Um, and then let me actually go to our competitors. Well, they're actually nice people. Uh, they uploaded the MDRs HTML, which I think is actually super useful. I actually like to use this. Um, the main definition of, or the main thing influencing whether you're class one device or not will be this rule 11. And I'm going to skip ahead over many things here again, but generally it says, um, software, which in, is intended with software intended to provide information, which is used to take decisions with diagnosis. So it's a typo here. It's crazy. Our therapeutic purposes classified as class two A. So if you, if your software provides information for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes, your class 2A. And I'm going to skip through everything here and just go ahead and read the last sentence, which is all well, the software is class 1. So if you provide this information, your class 2A or higher, if you read on, and that's the relevant part. So if we go back to our examples, like Vara doing breast cancer screening, sounds like information to uh, take decision with diagnostic purposes. So probably class 2A or higher, self -AP, treating depression probably and this is actually one of those edge cases 
like does it provide information for therapeutic purposes or does it actually do therapy is that even a distinction so that's where it gets super fuzzy you could argue uh, an app to provide um, to do treatment of depression is um, class 2a under this rule but then again you could argue maybe if it does direct treatment without like providing information maybe then it's actually class one so that's where it gets super messy and that's actually the um, the essence of the example uh, where we actually gathered all these class one devices and we have this table here if you search for class one software situation you find this table of different class one devices um, and in which countries they actually are because interestingly because it's so unclear like different uh, competent authorities so essentially different state authorities who are responsible for class one monitoring they come up with their uh, very own subjective interpretations of what a class one device is so for example in berlin we at least haven't observed a class one device being on the market yet so it seems likely that the interpretation here is very strict whereas in hamburg in germany there are a ton of class one devices on the market so the interpretation seems to be more lenient to some degree so the class one situation is a huge mess but Anyway, long story short, you need to like determine if you're class one or a higher class. If you're class one, that's very beneficial because if we go back to our notes, you literally save the 50K euros for a notified body and you also save the 12 months wait time for a notified body audit. So in other words, you only need to pay consultants like us or, or actually do it yourself, which would be free, which is actually also doable. Um, yeah, you, your, your cost for doing the documentation is super low. You don't have to pay the notified body so this might be like best case zero and if you're as fast as people with us you might be done in two to four months and don't have to wait for um for audits for 12 months of audits so like best case and this is an ideal scenario you could be on the market in four in two to four months which is pretty awesome as a startup but again class one is kind of like super um like it's a super great area right now all right, let's go. Let's skip ahead. Um, I'll go. I'll talk about this question later. Like next steps, whom to hire? What should you do? So the first thing you should do is you should hire someone who's uh, who will be the regulatory person in your company. That person doesn't need prior knowledge, and they should de dedicate at least fifty percent of their time to regulatory work. Uh, we've actually had pretty good experiences just with generally smart people, like even working students who just were interested in doing this, and I thought that was really impressive. But you need that person. What typically doesn't work very well is like the founder doing it part-time because as a founder, you tend to get distracted by things which are more important, like building products and getting money, which in my opinion is more important. <laughs> but uh, that often means that those projects don't go well because the founders uh, stop doing the regulatory work. All right, um, before we actually dive into what that regulatory work is in the next video, one last uh, note is like people ask us like, does it make sense to buy regulatory software? Um, and of course I'm biased here. We have our own software, it's called Formwork. You can find it here by navigating to QMS software. But what might you surprise, what might surprise you here is actually, I do not generally recommend buying software, which is an insane statement to make. It's probably like the worst marketing video ever. And um, the reason for that is software essentially just gives you tools for automating stuff, right? Um, but it doesn't help you in understanding all the regulatory requirements. So you need to know what you want to document first and how you like want to write your documents or even if you want to write some of those at all um, before you actually look into software, um, how to automate this. Uh, maybe like a good example is if you want to be an author and write a book, you should focus on how to write well and maybe write a lot by, uh, well, typing stuff out and then um, learning how you could improve that stuff you've just written um, but you shouldn't focus your time on selecting the best text editor because the best text editor best case is just going to make you like marginally faster in typing out your book but it won't make you a better author and the same is true for regulatory compliance software you need to kind of like know what you want to do first and then when you have an idea of how to do it then um, there, or, or of what you want to do then the regulatory software helps you automize this uh, automate this and there actually are like a lot of really really cool automations but again i wouldn't purchase regulatory software if the if you're at the very start of your journey all right that was nine minutes and hopefully maybe even the most condensed introduction you could ever get from any consultant and you didn't even have to pay any money for this so this was very good i think um, next we're actually going to look at 
how documentation, how typical documentation looks like to give you so you get an idea of, um, yeah, of what you would need to do if you would go down this path of becoming compliant with medical device regulations and bringing your device to market as a medical device.